Welcome to another edition of the Voice of Palestine, Voice of the Palestinian People. It's May 17, 2013, and I'm your co-host, Hanna Kawas. This week we'll be talking with two spokespersons for the Gaza Ark here in Canada, David Heap and Ihab Lutayef, who will update us on the project and what people here can do to help. Good evening to you, uh, David, and welcome to the Voice of Palestine again. Good evening, Hannah. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Yeah. C- could you uh, update us? I, I uh, hear that you are in uh, Italy, in Florence. Could you update us what you're That's doing right. there and uh, just give our listeners, uh, a, a, you know, a, a brief uh, 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 roundup of what you are doing. Right. So I'm, uh, as you said, a spokesperson for Gaza Zark, and I normally live in Canada. This year I have been uh, living and teaching in Europe, in France, uh, mainly in southern France. And uh, because I'm here and I continue my work with Gaza Zark, uh, I'm a spokesperson for Gaza Zark also in Europe. Mm-hmm. And so our many partner campaigns from uh, the Freedom Flotilla Coalition have, of course, been cooperating with us, and they're very excited to uh, now be part of the international campaign for Gaza's Ark. And our, uh, our partners here in Italy, it's, Freedom, it's called the Freedom Flotilla Italia, uh, have invited me here because they have a, uh, well, there's a very large uh, trade fair for sort of fair trade and sustainable uh, practices, and they have, uh, you know, obtained uh, a stand. So we're we're on display at this trade fair with thousands of people coming through. Because, of course, uh, Gaza's Ark, as your listeners may recall, is uh, a continuation of our work against the blockade, but it also has a, a commercial aspect. It involves uh, trade, not aid. So, getting away from the idea that what uh, Palestinians in Gaza need is. Uh, uh, humanitarian aid. Uh, we're uh, underlining the importance of the freedom of movement and the freedom of travel and the freedom to trade and commerce, right? Mm-hmm. So that they should, uh, if they're given the chance to uh, trade and travel like all the other peoples of the world and all the other ports in the Mediterranean, uh, they wouldn't need any international aid. They would simply uh, depend on their own economy as they have in the past. Yeah. So um, it's, it's an idea that it's a different look. For us, it's a continuation of our work against the blockade, but it's a different... Uh, aspect of it, if you like, because people, you know, they got in the habit of the way the media was always presenting it as a question of humanitarian aid, and that's really not the uh, uh, accurate way to look at it. The the better, much more uh, accurate uh, way to look at it is is a a question of of fundamental human rights and freedom of movement. Yeah, and and really the excuse the Israelis always gave that they were worried that uh, arms might be smuggled into Gaza. What, What they going to say now if you are just leaving Gaza? Arms struggle, uh, arms, exactly. arms, arms struggle, uh, smuggling from Gaza? The, <laughs> they want yeah. to be in their, uh, in exactly. their benefit, you know? I mean, uh, I, I, again, we, we really uh, expect any excuse from the Israeli government that commit war crimes mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. etc. But uh, it will be difficult for them to uh, st- stop the boat uh, and, and explain Explain it basically. Explain why they did yeah. the report. Um, having said that, you know the situation is really getting worse in Gaza, isn't it? Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. just recently there were a report about how they discuss putting the um, uh, Palestinian people on diet, uh, enough calories just mm-hmm. for them, so they won't starve, as uh, Haaretz put it. They they don't want the, the Palestinian. Mm-hmm. They, they they really uh, emphasize on the positive aspect of this diet, uh, you know, that they won't starve, you know, but they didn't say that, uh, you know, instead of 400 trucks going daily into Gaza, now only goes 67, which is really one-fifth or less than one-fifth. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe one seventh, even. So, wh- what do you hear of the situation? You haven't been together uh, since your last time on the boat, and uh, you. you... Um, well, I was finally able to travel to Gaza last October. Uh-huh. So, after one attempt by land that was frustrated in 2009 when we were stopped in Cairo, and then two attempts by sea in 2011 when our boat was stopped in uh, first in Greece and then 
in international waters, just 45 uh, miles from Gaza, and when the Tahrir was taken, I spoke to you at that time. I was finally able to travel in October uh, last year yeah. to an academic conference, actually, at the Islamic University of Gaza. I went in with a group of colleagues, uh, linguists, uh, going to a linguistics conference. Is with, it uh, the a same colleague. one we're talking about? Some of your listeners. Is it the exactly. same one? Exactly. A colleague who some of your, uh, some of your listeners might have heard of. Uh, so we were there in the end of October, which was when the last boat towards Gaza, the, most, the previous one, the Estelle, the, the Swedish one, mm -hmm. which had been throughout Europe all fall, all, well, all summer and part of the fall, it was actually uh, attacked and captured while we were there on the 21st of October. So we were able to bring uh, Chomsky to the port to, to make a statement about that, of course, at the time. Yeah. Uh, and then we left. Uh, he left sooner and we stayed for another week. Uh, working on the ARC and working with civil society groups. And we left in the beginning of November, just before the last attacks began. And, of course, that situation is very grim um, because, once again, we actually published something, the, the colleagues, uh, eight of us, and, and Chomsky as well, about the usual media manipulation, how it is real claims they're responding to rocket attacks, but they never uh, start the sequence of events when they... Uh, you know, provoked, the, went in and killed a child playing soccer and you know, did a series of things which, of course, they knew would provoke uh, an, an attack, a response from the Palestinians. Yeah. But the media in the West, in Canada especially, always swallows the Hasbara uh, lies about how, how these, these, uh, these uh, assaults begin. Yeah. So, as you say, the situation is very gra grave, and not, not only is the number of trucks coming in, uh, a fifth, perhaps, or a sixth, or a small fraction of what it was yes. before the blockade. Even more serious, the number of trucks coming out. Yes. Yes. <laughs> like the, the, the former uh, export economy is at perhaps, you know, two or three or five percent of its capacity. Uh, and it's just heartbreaking. I mean, when we were there, we visited some farmers who were growing herbs. Yes. They hoped, they had this hope, they invested a lot of energy and resources and money in growing some herb, fresh herbs for the European export market. And they said, these are going to be exported, yeah. you know, but made in Palestine. Yeah. And then we found out that they, were, they had to destroy them because they knew that there's just a few days. It's fresh herbs. They don't have, they're not good for very long, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. They knew that they were vulnerable to any kind of stoppage at the border. And as it turns out, Israel just said, no, you can't export them. And so they had to destroy their whole crop. Yeah, well, uh, and this is... Again, this is the problem when your economy is controlled by another state who at their whim can say, now you can export, now you can't export. Yeah. It doesn't make uh, you know, a natural economy. It yeah. makes a very, very unnatural situation. So imagine, imagine, David, if Canada is not allowed to export more than 2% of what it's exporting today. What will happen to the Canadian people? I mean, we would have a similar situation, massive unemployment. Uh, uh, a huge number of youth with no future, and uh, as I know as an educator, I mean, for me, the most important thing is if the young people don't have hope. If you steal hope from a generation of young people, it's not very surprising if they then do hopeless things. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very simple equation. You know, people without hope will do hopeless things. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we know that the population of Gaza is more than, more than half uh, young people and children, more than half uh, under 18 years of age, yes. and if they have no hope for the future, um, that's very, very serious. So uh, I think we have to do something to build hope, which is why the Gaza's Ark project is subtitled Building Hope, yes. right? because we know that one small boat with one, you know, one load of cargo coming out isn't going to change the economic uh, picture for 1.7 million people. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but it is, as usual, it's the statement from, you know, citizen to citizen, uh, civil society group taking direct action because we know that they know that the states of the world aren't going to, aren't going to act. It's going to be the people that lead and eventually leaders, governments will figure out what it follow. Mm -hmm. So we have, to, we have to continue going. We have to do something that builds hope. And that's so, in this case, visibly in the port of Gaza, that people here can see. They know, they've known for four or five years that we're trying to sail from the outside, right? Mm -hmm. But since uh, 2008, when the last boats got in, they didn't see any of the international solidarity boats. So now they will see the one that we're going to be rebuilding in the port of Gaza. Yeah. And the, in the you know, the Gate Association in Derbala and in the women's cooperatives making the handicrafts, they will see these goods have been bought by, you know, a fair trade organization in Australia or in Spain or in Norway yes. or from here in Italy. They'll say, you know, the people want to buy your goods. The people want you to have an economy that stands on its own feet, uh, and we believe in you. The people of the world yes. uh, are in solidarity yeah. with the struggle. We're very happy now 
Recently, we are, our international partners were joined by a South African campaign as well. So it's really becoming very international. Yeah, that's good, although, you know, realizing that a boat or two leaving Gaza won't really relieve the, the unemployment rate because uh, in young people it stands at 50 percent, and that includes the seasonal yeah. employment, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah no, it, it, it's terrible. Yeah. So uh, you know uh, the, how how you uh, wh how uh, what basically you you said you are in Florence. Uh, how you are received there and how people are responding uh, to your call and well, I, and to the Arc uh, project. I have to say it's very heartwarming in Europe, in Italy, in and elsewhere in Europe. The response is uh, very positive. That people. You know, they've sort of forgotten in some cases, depending about uh, where they are. They, they might have forgotten about the, the flotilla and about the campaign against the blockade. But when it's explained to them again, and we do have to, to explain it to them because, of course, the mainstream media isn't picking up our story. We mm -hmm. depend on alternative media like you. Um, you know, they, uh, they, they tend to open their hearts towards the cause because, as I say, the peoples of the world haven't forgotten the situation of the Palestinians of Gaza. It's the government. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I was at a, a fair trade event in, in Nice, where I live in France, in the whole region. They have a policy that in this local economy fair, they'd never buy uh, market goods which could be produced in the region, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's all about the you know, local economy. The one exception they make, Hannah, yeah. of all of this is that they said, but we will carry olive oil from Palestine. Even though the region produces its own olive oil, yeah. they say, it's important to carry olive oil from Palestine. Yeah, and I saw, mm -hmm. just last week, I saw peasants, you know, producers who are olive oil producers themselves buying Palestinian olive oil. And they say, we have to remember these people. Yeah. So the, the, the solidarity is very real. And it's much more, how shall I put it, it's not in the hands of the government, but it's much closer, it's much more out in the open in the public, and there are more people talking about it. If I wear, a, you know, Palestinian yeah, yeah. T-shirts, as many of my T-shirts tend to be, uh, I'll always be, uh, you know, have somebody in the street comment on it and say we have to, we have to remember Palestine. So I think there's a, an, an act for Palestine. So yeah. I think there's a high level of consciousness here, and that's because civil society has been working on it. You know, the trade unions, the student groups, the community groups have been working on it for a long time. So we can get there too. Yeah. It's a matter of uh, grassroots work. Yeah, that, no, that's that's good news actually, and uh, you know it's understandable why people don't want to buy uh, from other countries uh, for the basically the environment uh, uh, effect of these uh, the transportation and all that uh, uh, green gas uh, um, you know effects on the environment uh, for mm -hmm. the trucking or uh, through planes etc. But you know um, uh, I I want to go back to the situation in Gaza. Uh, uh, you mm -hmm. know, the, the fishermen having uh, lots of uh, problem because, you know, Israel violated even the so-called Oslo uh, Accord and reduced yep. it from 20 miles to 3 miles where people can fish. And just yesterday or the day before, uh, some spokesperson from the Israeli government stated that uh, the the zone, the security zone, is not 100 uh, uh, um, uh, meters, but it's 300 meters from the border with Israel. So, you know, I mean, they, they're keeping the squeeze on Gaza, and uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the situation in Egypt with the change of government, we don't see any uh, change in Israeli policy, whether on the border or in the Rafah crossing. What do you think uh, about uh, the, you know the, the these uh, measures that Israel is doing to the Gazan people. Yeah, well, it's clearly punitive. I mean, this is the thing. It's, it continues the policy of collective punishment. It has nothing to do with security, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, fishing boats catching fish, farmers planting their crops and 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 uh, you know cultivating their. Their, their wheat or whatever they cultivate along the buffer zone. None of these things are a threat to the security of Israel. Everybody knows that. Yeah. So it has nothing to do with anybody's security. It has everything to do with punishing the population. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is 
clearly a violation of international law, but uh, or repeated violations of international law. What can we do to draw attention to it? Well, we we talk about it, we write about it. Um, we have partners in the uh, Freedom Float to Look campaign who are also there among the people who accompany the fishermen, because as usual, the only way we can get attention in our Western countries from the media is often if there's somebody from, you know, in this case there's Italians there, who are uh, company, sometimes going out and accompanying fishermen or people from Spain or other countries. So they try to do what they can to uh, highlight the situation, which is you know, day in, day out, week in, week out, uh, just more oppression uh, from the occupier. Yeah. The situation in Egypt is very, very, very disappointing, I have to say. You know, that uh, we, were, we heard that the Palestinians who were leaving uh, in March to, to go to the... Um, World Social Forum in Tunisia uh, were treated, uh, they say, as bad as the Mubarak years. That's what they said. Yeah. You know, the guys, they said the young men, the men from 18 to 40, uh, had to be basically detained and uh, deported from the airport if they wanted to fly to Tunisia. Yeah. So they, they said, you know, these, the, the, hmm. unfortunately, you, know, you can have a change of government, but the, it's the last institution to change in many cases is the army. Yeah. And we know that there's a high degree of military cooperation still between the Egyptian military and the American military and the Israeli military. And, and I, with billions of dollars a year in military subsidies from Washington, yeah. um, that's not going to change very quickly, unfortunately. Yeah. And the same with the Egyptian security forces, I, I believe. Uh, just one final, yeah. Yeah, one final question, uh, uh, David. Uh, it's really a pleasure always talking with you. But how can people help uh, the the uh, project and uh, what they can do to help this project, this important project really, and it's in essence really yeah. emphasizing on the principle of, you know, uh, people depending on themselves and relying on themselves yeah. rather than on aid. Yeah, well, as in all cases, the, the flotilla efforts are entirely funded by human solidarity. We have no government funding. Uh, so. Um, people can donate online uh, at desertark.org. Uh, uh, you can donate there. Um, some people are really selling a, um, symbolic shares, so you can become one of the, the people that are supporting the Ark by you know, buying a symbolic share and becoming a part owner or several shares. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you donate $50 or more, we'll send you a certificate saying so you have a share in the Ark. Um, but we need to fund this. We've made a down payment on a boat, and we need uh, people's, uh, we need people's generosity to reach out and help funding it. Um, the other thing is we, we, we need to sell the cargo. We need to help the, you know, the producers I was talking about, the date producers and the matful and producers and the vivra and uh, zatar and all of those good Palestinian products. We need to help them sell it internationally. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, you know, if a community business or uh, an association or a cooperative or you know, a consumer group wants to get together and sponsor it uh, and buy, you know, uh, a part of part of the cargo, that that's also a sign of saying we believe in your economy and we believe you should have the right to export. Yeah. Of course, you. this also means you're sharing part of the risk. Yeah. Um, because you know, we know the risks of these voyages. We've sailed before. We've, you have and I, and many others have, have been uh, detained illegally, kidnapped, and, and detained in Israel and deported. So we know what the what the Zionist state and their navy is capable of doing. Yeah. So you can't all sail together on these small boats. But if you buy part of a cargo, you take you take it on part of the risk and saying we will accompany this voyage because we have a commercial interest in it. And then the interesting thing afterwards, if, if the worst happens, is then in our own countries, in Canada, in the States, and in Europe, uh, people can go to their governments and say, why are you not looking after my commercial interests? You know, we bought merchandise. Why is there no free trade from Palestine? Yeah. Uh, and in the discourse of Canada, where they supposedly believe in free trade, I think it would be an interesting thing to throw back at our conservative government and say, why is there no free trade for Palestinians? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, although you know they they consider any trade uh, from the Palestinian territory is really covered under the free trade agreement with Israel, but not in the case of Gaza, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, there's always people can support. You can find us as, as always. Our campaigns are about raising awareness. So we talk about it. We uh, bring it to our organizations and our community groups. Mm -hmm. We raise awareness. We raise funds. Yeah. And then, if necessary, we raise health. 
uh, when when the time comes. Yeah. So it's it's always a three part plan. Yeah, and uh, the important thing for people to know that the, the boat is not insured, nor the products in it are insured. I, I gather n not any insurance company. Would yeah, well, that's. <laughs> would do that. Yeah, there's not a lot of insurers who will insure you against the uh, the Israeli occupation movie. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah, so it's So you, you share the risk with us. Yeah. But it's it's, it's an act of solidarity yeah, to to buy in and believe. Yeah, that's it. It's an act of solidarity and uh, act of uh, f feeling with the uh, suffering people of Gaza. Really we thank you very much right. uh, David and uh, it's again a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, have a great evening. And, thank you very much. And have a nice trip Thank you. and uh, keep up the good work. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure to speak to you. Goodbye. And uh, with us uh, on the phone now is uh, Ihab Lutayev uh, from Montreal, I believe. Is it in Montreal, Ihab? I am in Montreal. Yeah, yeah. okay. And uh, welcome again to the Voice of Palestine. It's always uh, nice talking to you. Always nice to be with you, Hamid. Yeah. Could you tell us uh, a bit about the uh, uh, purchasing of the Gaza Ark and what difficulties you faced in uh, purchasing it, and what's the uh, where where we stand at now with the board? Uh, sure. Let me go back uh, just a little bit to say that uh, we have um, started. Uh, the, the, the idea of sailing a boat from inside Gaza, carrying products from Palestine to the outside world, uh, after uh, our last uh, mission uh, with the Canadian boat to Gaza, the Tahrir, uh, to, to try to break the blockade from the outside in, in November 2011. So it, it was in early 2012 that we started talking about uh, instead of starting the project, starting the work from the outside, from Europe, let us start from inside Gaza to simulate the economy of Gaza, to create uh, more movement in the port of Gaza, building of uh, uh, boats, which is something that hasn't happened in Gaza for some time. And we debated whether to build a boat from scratch or to uh, find a suitable boat, because there is no cargo boats in Gaza. There are only fishing boats of different sizes. So there were two options, either to build a boat from scratch or to find a large enough fishing boat that is in good status that is suitable to be converted into a cargo boat uh, and that can sail in, in the high seas, basically in international waters. And that is what we settled uh, on. And um, we, we went through a very thorough process of investigating what boats are available in the port of Gaza, what their capabilities are, what their status is. We inspected a couple of boats. We are working uh, with, among our team, is a, uh, a marine uh, um, consultant engineer who is of Palestinian origin himself. He went to Gaza a couple of times and inspected boats and drew the plan uh, for us to, 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 to basically um, buy a boat and convert it into a cargo boat. And uh, over the past uh, couple of months and struggling with many bureaucratic difficulties and other uh, type of, of, of slow moving things, and of course we have to appreciate that things in Gaza due to the occupation, due to the blockade, due to so many factors move quite slowly. But finally, uh, just this last week, we did um, pay the down payment of one of the largest for one of the largest fishing boats in Gaza, and we took control of it. And the building is going to start within a day or two now to convert it according to our plans to a, a cargo vessel that can uh, cross the Mediterranean with carrying Palestinian products. Mm -hmm. How big is the boat? Uh, yeah. 
Uh, the boat, I don't want to give all the details, yeah, uh, but okay. the boat is about about 25 meters. Yeah, okay, good, good. And uh, you're going to convert it so you could use it for uh, transporting uh, these Palestinian goods. And, uh, um, you know, uh, you, you put the down payment. Uh, uh, obviously, you haven't covered everything, but uh, uh, you obviously you, you don't have uh, the rest of the money yet, but... Uh, Hopefully, by a people generous donation, you'll be able to uh, uh, pay all uh, the price of, of the boat. Could you tell us a bit about that and the need? And uh, if you want, say, figures, that'll be good too. So our listeners sure, I... know where we are at. No, there is, there is nothing to hide, actually, from that aspect. We like to be very transparent, especially on the, on the financial side. We do consider that all this project is really owned by everybody who put a, a penny or a, or a dollar or, or, or $10,000 in the project. Everybody of those owns a, a part of, of this work, and thus we, are not, we, we, we won't conceal anything except if it is related to security reasons or stuff that can jeopardize the, the project. Um, we could have waited uh, a, a short period more and paid the, the, the boat in full, but um, the idea we wanted to, uh, as, as we mentioned in our press release that uh, came out, we have raised over $90,000, uh, and most of our expenses uh, till now are only focused on uh, the, the purchase of the boat and the plans to uh, convert it. And thus, what we are trying to do is to have money with us as well now that we have the boat to be able to start the building. We didn't want to pay all the money we have in the price or t towards the price of the boat and then not have money or be waiting at a bottleneck before we can start the building slash conversion uh, process that is the important work that really uh, we, we want to start with and that's going to be uh, more challenging and more time consuming than just buying the boat. So um, we, we did fundraise till now um, uh, over $90,000, uh, around half of which was paid towards the down payment of the, of the boat. Uh, and we, are, we, we have money with us to do the first phase of the construction uh, process, um, but in that case we won't be able to pay the, 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 the installments uh, that the, 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 the seller of the boat is expecting to get installments uh, every every month, uh, that's our commitment uh, to him. So um, we actually paid um, uh, over over half of that, uh, closer to uh, closer to two thirds of that to to the boat owner at this point. And we have some money that we can start using to uh, to, to to the towards the building process. But from the financial point, um, we really need to step up our fundraising efforts right now. Uh, because the conversion process is estimated to, to cost uh, uh, over $100,000 uh, to get the boat in a reasonable and secure uh, status that it can travel safely. Uh, and um, at the same time, uh, we need to also prepare for the cost of the trip itself and other uh, administrative and uh, various, uh, various smaller expenses, of course. So this is the, the situation in, in the fundraising. We hope that when we start uh, showing on our website and through various media, the process of the building starts uh, starting uh, visually and people can see photos and all that, that people will be really uh, encouraged and energized to make uh, uh, quick, strong donations so that uh, there will be no slowness in the building process, at least not due to the lack of funds. There are other factors that sometimes we might not be able to control, but we want to be able to be uh, under our own schedule, uh, financially at least, as long as these obstacles don't, uh, don't come up. Mm. Uh, you know, I mean, um, the the problem uh, also, if if there was a free at least uh, outlet, one one uh, you know uh, uh, 
uh, uh, exit that the Palestinians can take their products out of Gaza. For example, I'm thinking of the Rafah crossing. Uh, we won't have any need to, to do uh, this uh, project, right? So why, why the Tahrir revolution, uh, the Tahrir Square revolution, didn't lead us to where we want, where, uh, you know, uh, freedom of movement uh, from Gaza and back through the uh, Rafah crossing. Were, were you disappointed with the position of the new uh, so-called uh, uh, revolution in, uh, that took over in, uh, in Egypt as, as an Egyptian? Um, I, I would like to touch on two points. The first point is and maybe I slightly disagree with you about that there would be no need to struggle against the uh, naval blockade of Gaza if the, if the Rafah crossing was open. I think that the people of Palestine have a port on the Mediterranean, which is Gaza, have a coast on the Mediterranean, the coast of the Gaza Strip, and they should not be um, prevented from using that and forced to use their border with another country. Uh, I mean, if, if Canada can trade with the United States but can't send its products through the Pacific or through the, uh, the Atlantic Oceans, that would not be a natural, normal, fair situation. Uh, so I think that even if the Rafah border was fully open, uh, the, 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 the blockade of Gaza is an unfair, unjust, and unjustified, and illegal blockade that all people of the world should really fight against. Um, but uh, if, we, if we look at the Egyptian situation, uh, maybe, maybe some people had very high expectations. Um, I would say I had moderate expectations, which were still better than what the situation is today. Because I think I knew as an Egyptian that any government that would come to Egypt um, in a realistic way would have to uh, assure the, um, the United States and its allies and all the, peop the countries that support Israel, that it will to a certain extent abide by its responsibilities towards the, the peace treaty, etc., etc. We know all that is not easy to, to change, and we know that Egypt is facing so many problems that it does not have its fate in its own hands to be able to take very bold decisions. But I am particularly disappointed that the, 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 the current um, Islamist uh, regime uh, and the Islamist parties that were louder in talking about uh, their commitment to Palestine and the people of Palestine than maybe other um, trends in Egyptian society who had really started to forget or not be very interested about justice for the Palestinian people. Uh, the, 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 the current... Uh, uh, power holders in Egypt uh, have w had more expectations to come from them than, than what they are doing. Uh, so um, there is always danger in the political game and in putting yourself in, um, in the hands of governments that have many factors uh, to, to, to calculate with, um, that, uh, that we as a project and as work of the Canadian Boat to Gaza or the Freedom Flotilla as a whole, well, that's why we totally refuse uh, to work with, with governments at all, no matter how friendly uh, they, they might seem to be at a certain point in time. And I would add another example here, that now that the Turkish government has sort of reached a settlement about the Navi Marmara with Israel, uh, the activists in Turkey uh, who were, who were um, leading the, uh, the, the, the work in the Mavi Marmara and in the Freedom Flotilla uh, One work, they are refusing uh, and, and sort of uh, standing against the normalization that might happen or just forgetting that there were problems between Turkey and Israel uh, because uh, that there is a settlement now that is being reached about the, the victims of the Mavi Marmara. So I think we, we are working from a point of view of principle. We're working from a point of view of um, justice. Uh, governments don't always work that way, and that's why we are needed. We need to keep our presence and our voice high uh, and loud and clear because the, um, 
uh, the, the governments don't do it that way. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, the the uh, ark uh, um, gonna carry uh, basically Palestinian agricultural products, or there is other things. And uh, just while we are talking about that, uh, how people can uh, get more information about these products? I, I, I gather there will be honey and dibis, which is the molasses and maftool and couscous and Palestinian couscous, that's the maftool, and the za'atar and dukkah. Uh, could you tell us a bit about, uh, you know, the products uh, and how people can get the information uh, about these products? Uh, the information about the products or about anything in the project, we have actually a very thorough website that is available in six, seven languages now. It's really uh, internationally supported and translated to many languages. Of course, the English remains to be the main uh, uh, part of the website, but many parts of it are translated to many other languages. Uh, and the, 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 the address of the website is GazaArk. Uh, so one word, GazaArk.org, um, G-A-Z-A-A-R-K. Dot org, and it has all the information people would need about the project, about the updates, and about the product as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, no, it's not only agricultural products, actually, that we are focusing on. We are trying to have a diversity of products that are being produced in Gaza, handcrafts, uh, um, woven materials, um, uh, small uh, uh, artifacts. Uh, we are just trying not to stretch our project too much, so we're trying to limit the products that we're going to carry or that we're going to help um, uh, um, uh, sell, but um, it's basically we're trying to make it a diverse cross-section of everything that is produced uh, in Gaza. And uh, at the same time, we're going to be very um, um, serious in trying to put the buyer in touch with the seller in Gaza directly. We are just an intermediary, but all, all the money other than a small shipping fee would go to the producer, and that is, of course, uh, whether or not the buyer would receive his, uh, his or her or their uh, material because of what Israel can, can do uh, to interfere with that. So um, we hope that that as well, I mentioned earlier that we want the project to um, energize a bit the, 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 the economy of Gaza and the industries in Gaza. And through this, this is another aspect of uh, energy that we hope will, uh, will, will come through uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the project, which is to have a bit more um, selling of products. Uh, by the manufacturers in Gaza, agricultural and otherwise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And again, uh, people don't have to buy things. They could donate uh, towards the whole project in general, and that's on the website. Uh, am I correct? Uh, yes. Uh, it, it, as soon as you get to the website, you will uh, find a way to, to donate. Um, and uh, as soon as you uh, menu, uh, like navigate the website, you will find all the information that you that you might need. It's, yeah. There is really a wealth of information there, and I am proud about the, the clarity and the the, the, the uh, ease of information uh, on the website. It's really a user-friendly website. Mm -hmm. You can also find uh, a good example of uh, who uh, from um, international figures are supporting and endorsing. Uh, the project like Nobel laureates, like uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, like uh, members of parliament uh, are, uh, from, from Britain, uh, from Germany, from the European Parliament, from Australia. Um, I wish I could also say members of parliament from Canada, but unfortunately um, we are uh, lacking, I guess, 
yeah. uh, people of conscience to that uh, to that level in Canada at this point. Yeah, actually, uh, that's there, that nothing new either. It goes all the way to 1948 and before. But uh, you know, uh, I'll give you one last word to our listeners. Uh, and uh, do, do you think, really, in addition to such uh, uh, projects, uh, what other things can uh, people do to help the struggle of the Palestinian people? And what do you think of the BDS movement? Um, I, 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 will, I will get to, to the BDS in a second, but let me just also clarify one thing. Um, we are trying to work with movements and groups all over the world as Gaza's Ark Project to tell them that even if in your country um, there is no ability to financially support uh, our, uh, our project or to be directly involved in it, please stay in touch as pro-Palestinian activists, as activists for Palestinian justice, uh, and use our, the dynamics of Gaza's Ark project to make awareness and to change the stance in your country about Gaza and about Palestine uh, in a, as a whole. And that, saying that as an intro to getting into BDS and any other type of struggle or any other type of tool, because really all these are tools that we are using and we, are, we, we should utilize towards getting justice and fairness for the Palestinian people. Um, the BDS movement is getting, is getting success after success uh, worldwide, and um, we all have to support it in any and every way we can, uh, whether by personal practices or by writing letters of support or joining in actions, etc., because it is, it is far, it's already quite late uh, that Israel is considered a normal, um, benign uh, citizen of the world community, where really it is a, a country that is oppressing uh, a large population of people for, uh, for, for, for generations and generations, uh, for decades, and it should not enjoy just for the case of, for the reason of justice and fairness, it should not enjoy the status of a good citizen in the world community. And one way to make it feel that it's not a good citizen and force it to change its ways is through actions like the BDS movement. Yeah. We really thank you, Ehab, and uh, keep up the good work. Uh, and again, uh, we hope to talk to you soon again. Thanks. Pleasure, pleasure talking to you and pleasure to reach your listeners, uh, Hannah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a good night. Yeah. Bye-bye. You too. And that was Hannah Kawas talking with David Heap and Ehab Lotayev, both from Gaza's Ark. And people who want more information or want to donate can check out their website at www.gazasark.org. That's gazasark.org. And with that, we conclude another edition of The Voice of Palestine. I've been your co-host, Marian Kawas, and our final piece of music is by Lebanese singer Marcel Khalife, Walking Tall. We dedicate it to the proud Gazan people who continue to walk tall and resist Israeli occupation.